on your Monday episode of Locked On Raptors, two-way players to dream on? Really? Hell yeah! We're talking about that and so much more coming out of Raptors Summer League coming up on today's show. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday, July the 22nd, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show over on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server, a great place to come talk ball, talk Raptors, talk offseason stuff, talk sports cards and collectibles, if you so please. All going on in the Locked On Raptors Discord, a great listener community we've got building. Come be part of it. It's free to join. Link in the description of the podcast, as always, if you'd like to join uh, of course you can find the show for free on your audio app of choice by subscribing following rating reviewing etc etc much appreciated when you support us there helps us go up the charts makes my ego feel good etc uh you can also go to youtube and subscribe to the locked on raptors youtube channel when you do that hit the notification bell button you'll get a heads up via push notification every single time the show premieres or goes live so you never miss a second of the action today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. make every moment more as playoffs wind down the sports stop sporting like we want them to but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost for a bonus daily that's right there's something for everyone every day all summer long visit fanduel.com to get started and we will get started here on a summer league recap episode a return from vacation episode for me feeling refreshed feeling all uh overexposed to the sun all that good stuff and we're gonna dig into our biggest takeaways from raptors summer league get into a good bad and hmm summer league edition and talk about a bit of news and notes around the raptors world from the last few days we're gonna do it all with our dear pal from raptors and seven his Substack newsletter and sportsnet among other things it's our pal vivek jacob big v How's it going, pal? It's great to be talking to you once again. Great to be talking to you. Going through a bit of that, you know, lull where the Euros are over, Copa mm-hmm. America's mm-hmm. over, the T20 Cricket World Cup's over. We're just trying to get to the Olympics. Thankfully, we had some summer league action, depending mm-hmm. on what you watched. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was good to have some basketball in between. And, uh, you know, here we are with our takeaways. Yeah, man. Um, also, the the real sports going on in the summer. Love Island USA is over. It's very upsetting as well. Uh, <laughs> I haven't actually finished the finale, and I'm sure I'm going to be disappointed by the end. Uh, we don't like Kendall in our house if you're a Love Island USA fan. Anyway, let's continue on and get into our big takeaways from after summer league. Again, we got a good bad hmm coming up a little bit later. We'll get into the nitty gritty of some guys who popped or did not at summer league. But just for you, Big V. Overall takeaways, five games, they win the first two, it all looks very exciting, and then it all kind of goes downhill from there as Grady Dick no longer is available to play due due to the injury he picked up. Of course, Jonathan Mobo didn't play the last four games either, the last three and a half games, uh, whatever it was. So, you know, you didn't get a total look at all of the guys here for the Raptors at Summer League and the performance suffered as a result, but uh, big broad takeaways for you. What are you thinking about coming out of Summer League from a Raptors perspective? I think for me, obviously, the first thing you're looking at is the rookies and how they fared. And I think you look at it, especially the guys who could potentially figure into the rotation. You look at Jacoby, you look at uh, Mobo, you look at uh, Shed, Mm -hmm. maybe. Um, And I think for me, it was about having guys who can stay in front of the ball again. Um, What a beautiful thing. (laughs) And I, I think obviously there were moments where uh, they would have had their struggles, uh, but I, I do think that was probably the big takeaway for me. We saw some nice individual moves from Jacoby Walker uh, just here and there. Um, Walter, I'm going to keep doing that too. Wal- Walker just <laughs> rolls off the tongue. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to catch that before the, the freaks in the comments get very angry at you, Big. Yeah. I'm looking up for you. <laughs> yeah, appreciate you. Um, and so I think that's probably my biggest takeaway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm on the same lines. I think for me, the takeaway overall is that the Raptors have a 
real shot at building that sort of shadow core thing that they've done in the past where they've got the main guys who we know are the the sort of core guys in the team you're seven or eight but i think over the last few years the you know the drop off after seven or eight has been pretty significant it's been sort of vets with low upside it's been underperforming guys with not a ton of upside recently drafted and a lot of sort of two-way guys and you know guys who are not really going to be part of the long-term plan soaking up those minutes in spots you know eight nine ten eleven twelve on the roster and it's not to say that this year it's going to be okay all these four guys they took in the draft are going to step in and be those guys in the rotation and do it capably but i do think in the next one two three years we're going to start to see these guys at least a couple of them pop and round into form and all of a sudden you'll look around and say hey like there's some young talent at the back of this roster that can either help us or be interesting in potential swing trades. If that's what the Raptors are looking at as their sort of long-term way to upgrade the talent of the roster, which based on them being probably too good to truly tank to the very bottom and based on their track record of always kind of being in trade conversations, having all their picks in hand, that seems like a, a pretty viable way, a pretty likely way they're going to go about trying to upgrade the overall talent around Scotty Barnes and Emmanuel quickly. And so having those guys is awesome. It's great for building depth. It's great for having uh, sort of regular season functionality where you can swap guys in and out. You can play heavier bench looks and not rely on your starters for 40 plus minutes as we've seen in recent years. I think we saw the very sort of beginning of laying the seeds for that shadow core uh, in the form of Shed and Walter and Mobo and Alra Shamshe as well, who I'm going to get into a little bit when we get into the good, the bad, and the hmm. Was there a guy for you, Big V in particular, who stood out the most? I think we can probably lump Grady Dick in here as well, just because he is super young, younger, I think, than all but Walter on this team. So, um, you know, he, he's obviously part of this sort of shadow core thing going forward, even though it's likely he's going to start this season. But is there someone, something, an individual game, even an individual sort of sequence of plays that stood out to you as something that's your sort of biggest positive takeaway from Summer League here? I think it has to be Grady. I think when you mm -hmm. look beyond the rookies, the one thing you want to see uh, is, hey, who has taken their game to another level? Who, you know, if, if you're looking to be a, like a bona fide NBA rotation player, then you should be able to play above the level of Summer League. And I think sure. Brady, um, for him to showcase what he did and look clearly um, like he's too good for Summer League, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the most encouraging thing. Uh, and hopefully that confidence carries over into training camp. Hopefully that bulk carries over as well. Uh, <laughs> and, you, you know, that momentum uh, rides through all season. Uh, obviously, we'll get into the bad later and there's the opposite end of the spectrum. But mm -hmm. I think uh, at the top of the list, it, it would be crazy for me. Yeah, I think Grady was super impressive in that opening game. Yeah, he didn't hit his threes, whatever. I don't care that the guy who is a bit of a streaky gunner type three point shooter is going to miss some shots because guess what? He thinks the next one's going in and that's all I really care about. He's not going to stop putting up threes because he went 0 for 9 over a couple of games in Summer League. And I think we saw last uh, offseason the sort of stupidity of overreacting to some rough shooting for Grady Dick. The guy's a shooter. He's a pure shooter as they come. And I think the sort of additions to his floor game, the extra physicality that helps him on the glass, the playmaking, all of that is the stuff that's the prevailing positive takeaway from Summer League as far as the way the team could be impacted this season by one of the guys who played. Uh, I was really impressed by a lot of Jamal Shedd's work as well. I, I think him and Jacoby Walter each had their moments. I think Walter really settled in in those last couple of games. Um, his free throw stuff is really interesting to me. Gets to the rim a ton, and I, I think he's got the sort of physicality to eventually grow into someone who can kind of absorb that contact, turn a lot of those free throw opportunities into three-point play opportunities and all, all of that. Um, but Jamal Shedd, for me, the on-ball defense, the playmaking, the pick-and-roll creation, the pocket passes to rolling bigs, um, really, I, I think we were sold that Jamal Shedd does basically a little bit of everything but shoot threes reliably right now. And I think that very much held true at summer league the threes will still be the swing skill for him that turn him from maybe a backup guy to someone who can be a little bit more than that um or or you know it might be the thing that keeps him in the league long term you know there, there's still a lot for him to sort out on the offensive end but i like his rim pressure i like the way he sets the table for others and the on-ball defense stuff from him is absolutely as advertised 
super in on Jamal Shedd. And uh, not to say that he's going to go and get minutes this year, because I think there will be some competition for those backup guard minutes with another guy that we're going to talk about in a second here. But overall, yeah, I, I think those are the the sort of positive pullaways. Would have been nice to see more Mobo. Um, you know, I think Brandon Carlson had some moments here and there, but Walter, Shed, Grady Dick, the guys you would hope were going to pop when they played really did for stretches at least. And uh, I think that's basically all you can do with Summer League is look for the flashes, look for the positives, and um, hope they can be strung together for longer stretches once we get into the pros coming up this season. We're going to come back on the other side, Big V, get into our good, bad, and hmm. From Summer League, we'll do that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by friends over at FanDuel. And look, it's, yeah, a bit of a light spot in the sports calendar for now, but that's not going to last because the Olympics are coming up. Team Canada cruising through France, taking down Wemby and Gobert. You love to see that. Comfortably handling Puerto Rico on Sunday. On the men's side of things, Canada very much in line for medals. And the women's side as well, a very solid squad going to Paris as well. Maybe you want to put some money down on Team Canada winning medals at the Olympics. You can do that with FanDuel. Go check it out. Find the odds. Make the bets you want to make. And, of course, I'm a big proponent of the happiness hedge as well. If you are going to throw money down on sports, throwing it down on the team your favorite team is playing to win so you get some money even if your team loses – that's the way to go, baby. So, you know, Canada against Greece, perhaps, or Canada against uh, any team they're going to come across in the group stage. If you're a little worried that Canada might fall, you can go and throw a little bit of money down on the team they're playing to win so you get that happiness hedge in the bank at the very least. Go check it out. All summer long, FanDuel is hooking up customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball and of the Locked On Podcast Network. Back at it here with Big V, Vivek Jacob from Raptors in 7 and from, of course, Sportsnet with all of his great NBA coverage over there. Uh, as we get into the good, the bad, and the hmm of Toronto Raptors Summer League. If you're unfamiliar with this segment, if you're new to the show during the season after every Raptors game that is played, we play a game called Good, Bad, and Hmm, where we talk about a thing we liked, a thing we didn't like, and a thing that has us a wee bit intrigued about the latest in Toronto Raptors basketball. We will start with the good, and I will give you the floor, Big V. What was your good from this game? Or from the, from Raptors Summer League, that is. You threw me off for a second there. Hmm. I was like... <laughs> um, in terms of the good of Summer League, uh, beyond, you know, kind of seeing some of that on-ball defense, uh, I, I really like uh, Jacoby Walter's cutting. I, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, in addition to the stuff you said that intrigues you about uh, getting to the free throw line, potentially, and one potential, all of that, I think he just has a really good nose for getting to the paint. Um, and I think that, He's also pretty patient when he's around the basket. Like even mm -hmm. even the final game against the Spurs, he had that one move where um, he showed great footwork, had a couple of feints, and then went up um, to finish. And I think that's the type of stuff that you, when you see it from a rookie, um, it shows that you know he's as athletic as he may be. He's a basketball player first, and I think 100%. that's the stuff that really like encourages me. Yeah, I mean, that was similar with Grady last year, right? What was, oh, he's a shooter, but also he's just like really, really adept at cutting at the right time and making the most of the advantages others are creating on the floor to find a little pockets of space to go and, you know, receive passes to finish plays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, man, I, they're not going to win a lot of minutes probably, but lineups that feature Scotty Barnes plus Grady Dick and Jacoby Walter just flying around off the ball super in on all of that man you can run split action you can run all manner of different things with the gravity those guys figure to have obviously it's going to take a bit for nba defenses to really sort of oh accept that jacoby walter is a threat from deep um it's always a bit of a process to become a guy who has gravity i think grady dick is already pretty close to that after his rookie season that's his whole reputation as a player is having that off ball gravity and i think it's only going to get more uh sort of effective as time goes on here as well yeah i think that's a great one my good dj carton 
Someone who I did not pay a whole lot of mind to at the end of last season because I was frankly not paying a whole lot of mind to anything the Toronto Raptors were doing after March the 1st when Scotty Barnes got hurt. Uh, it was a rough go, but Carton, I thought, really popped in some stretches of summer league. Um, super athletic, really stood out as one of the most athletic guys on the Raptors summer league team. Some really impressive sequences of on-ball defense, sliding his feet, blocking shots. Um, you know, and I think offensively, he's got a little bit of juice to him to kind of get downhill, get into the teeth of the defense. A couple of big dunks here and there. Um, I, I really liked what I saw from Carton. I, I think, too, on a team that, doesn't really clearly have a true backup point guard right now. This is not to say that DJ Carton's going to go and get backup point guard minutes. He's a two-way guy. He always got to temper expectations and be realistic here. But uh, because I think Davion Mitchell is more of a two-guard and it shouldn't really be tasked with a lot of on-ball creation, because I think Jamal Shedd is going to need some time, frankly, just as a rookie coming in to get his sea legs, probably needs some time in the G League just to get used to running the show at, in the pros. I think there's a world in which DJ Carton gets rotation minutes as a backup guard for this team if he can hold up that two-way play that he showed down the stretch. I think the Raptors are pretty high on him. And, you know, we'll see. Again, two-way guys, you can dream on them all you want, and usually those dreams do not pay off with any kind of uh, happiness at the end. But I do think um, DJ Carton has a shot here just because of the athleticism he brings to the table. He's like 6'3", a little bit bigger for a guard as well. Um, I, I'm pretty interested in DJ Carton just as a guy in the Raptors plans going into the season and, and think of the two way guys they have between Shamshe Carlson and Carton is very clearly the guy most likely to receive minutes at the big club uh, for the Raptors this year. And I think it's, it was a pretty impressive summer league showing for him. He was probably one of the two or three better best players on the team uh, over the course of the five games. I'd argue uh, let's get to the bad. What you got for your bad here, Big B. Well, I think this is the same one as you. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's probably worth spending a second on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the same way we talked about, hey, you want to see uh, the non-rookies show that, hey, they're above Summer League. Um, mm -hmm. When you don't see that, it is a bit discouraging. And for Ojai Abaji um, to have this opportunity to kind of showcase himself and show what he's been working on, all of that, I think this was pretty disappointing. I think. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, I was watching Jama's press uh, press conference where he spoke. Uh, well, I guess it was more of a scrum uh, where mm -hmm. he spoke about Ochai, and he was asked about, you know, hey, what what does Ochai bring to the table on the offensive end? Um, and he called him an elite finisher, which really puzzled me. Um, I think if you want to call him a really good cutter, I can I can see that. He sure. definitely recognizes those windows really, really well. And, you know, during the season, we saw that chemistry that him and Kelly Olynyk share. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think he's a bad finisher. Yep. And that's what really hurts him. Like to have that ability to cut to the basket, but then not finish uh, often enough uh, when, when you get there. I think that's been a problem for him. Obviously, the jump shot is a problem. Uh, and so when you're trying to be a 3 and D guy, a little things king, um, those are the things you need. For sure, man. And, you know, again, he's sort of billed as this stout defensive player. I didn't see a ton of that really either in summer league. You know, moments here and there, the team in general was much better with ball pressure and staying in front than they typically have been uh, with their young players in recent years. But, yeah, it, it's been a pretty rough go overall and you know i think he still can kind of get moved off a spot too easily gets hung up on screens too easily and if he's going to be that sort of two three wing defender type you just can't have that be a thing you're running into in summer league like he really should have as a third year player a four-year college guy who won a national championship and all of the praise that came with that like he should have looked better in summer league to give you some kind of hope for what he can be in the rotation going forward and for a guy who's going to go in with a half dozen guys vying for the minutes at his position. I don't know if this summer league set Ochai up very well going into the season. And look, like I am the last person to overreact to summer league. I think we get way too in our heads about it. There is just so little meaning to glean from it overall. You look at the flashes, you look for the little things to give you excitement or encouragement. But I do think in the case of a third year player looking this out of his depth, that's a red flag and really needs to be monitored going into the season. 
you know, I, I guess this also kind of ties into the conversation about the trade. Um, you know, I, I don't think there were many people at the time of the deal decrying that this was some sort of terrible move by the Raptors front office. Maybe a bit of an unorthodox one, but uh, for a guy you know, in, in Abaji who, you know, in theory had just as much a chance of, of hitting it as any 29th pick plus Kelly Olenek, I, I think it was still process wise a totally fine deal. But does Isaiah Collier having a couple pops as a 29th pick for the Jazz in summer league at all change your perspective on that, Big V? Are you ruining the day the Raptors traded for Ochai Abaji at this point, or does that still feel like a sound process trade, even if Abaji doesn't really hit here? Um, I mean, I guess I, I think it's a perfectly fine trade. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have like a huge issue with it. Obviously, the the one you take issue with is the Pascal trade, <laughs> and and so <laughs> yes. uh, I think in a vacuum, when you look at this deal, it, it's not a major issue, uh, and I think when you possibly look in hindsight, uh you could be in a situation two years from now where I think that's when you have like that last Pacers pick that you'll be using. Mm -hmm. um, by the time you use that pick, the Raptors might not have, have a single other player from right. the Pascal trade. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy stuff, man. Uh... <laughs> like Bruce Brown, Kelly Olenek, Ochai. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh... It's not what you want. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Pascal trade bad. I, I I was not hoping to relitigate that this summer. The, 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 in the middle of summer, coming off vacation. Thanks for ruining vacation and making me feel sad again, Big B. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. No, you're right. It, it, it's it's tough. Like I I think the trade itself still totally fine and defensible. I think a second draft guy in a, in a Baji totally fine. I, I'm also not like worried about Isaiah Collier. I know there are lots of people who liked Isaiah Collier. Guess what? There, there was just never a way he was going to have a pathway to reaching his full ceiling on a team built around Scotty Barnes and Manuel quickly. He's a guard who needs the ball in his hands, and that was just not going to be a thing that was going to happen on the Raptors in enough abundance for him to get where he's going to go down the line. And that may not happen with the Jazz either. They have Keontae George, who's very good and may be their starting guard of the future. So um, I'm not you know, mad about the 29th pick performing well in summer league or anything like that. I think that's a silly thing that you can only really evaluate trades based on the process at the time. That's the best way to do it at least. And I still think it was pretty sound. You got Kelly Olenek at the door and uh, they still had four picks in this draft and a lot of them look pretty damn good. So yeah, not yeah. feeling too bad there. Let's get to and the quickly yeah, sorry, before the people get mad at me, obviously Walter would show from this Pascal trade, right? And so, this is true. This is true. <laughs> you're right. Again, you're, you're, you're being aware of the sickos in the comments getting mad. It's uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, Monday it's morning. We have it's Monday yeah. morning, so we gotta we gotta get with it. <laughs> uh, let's get to the hmm, shall we? What you got for your hmm? Uh, I I think the easy hmm is, is probably Chomche. I think yeah. when you look at uh potential of why the Raptors might have drafted him and said, hey, take a guy late here, take a flyer on a guy that is definitely raw. I think we saw those moments, especially, you know, uh, finishing around the basket, a um, mm -hmm. bit of that deer in the headlights uh, type of finishing. I think uh, that stuff that uh, he needs more reps and he just needs more experience and just getting up and down the floor. Um, and you saw it, you know, like, Kind of there's moments where shed and him were connecting but the mm -hmm. finish isn't there uh sure. and so what you want to see with the project with the project is those you know those things that you can build on and mm -hmm. obviously i think we saw the shot blocking in spades uh and that's probably uh the most intriguing aspect of his game and so yeah. uh yeah in terms of a hmm uh, hard not to go with a project yeah, I, I'm with you fully on on Shamshe being my hmm. I, I think it might be a believer. Uh, the defensive instincts seem very real with him. The shot blocking stuff. Yeah, he's got to worry about not getting seven fouls in games. Thank you, Summer League, for not fouling out. It's beautiful. Um, 
but yeah, like the, the fouling got it has to be cleaned up, but the timing, the rim protection instincts are all really, really there. Um, you know, you still got to work on the sort of finer points of like pick and roll defense, where his positioning is, getting back to his man, um, not kind of turning his back, kind of getting you know put into the spin cycle a little bit and kind of losing his bearings. That was all there. That's the rawness that was clearly part of the scouting report for him. But think about this, like the five summer league games he played is more games than we had like pro tape on him of before the draft. He had three games in the battle to go off of. So we're just adding more and more information to um, what we have on Sham Shea. And I think what we saw in summer league to me suggests that, you know, the sort of pr- prognostications of it's four or five years until he's ready for NBA minutes. I think that's maybe a little bit conservative. I think the the, the defense, the mobility, the rebounding was pretty impressive as well for, you know, he's kind of got sticky hands on the boards. It looked like too. Um, I think that all suggests that maybe he's a little bit closer than he was given credit for. Um, I understand the reticence to project him for anything serious in the NBA as an 18 year old youngest guy in the draft playing um, very few games that have been scouted and gotten to be seen. But I think the, uh, the, the, the defensive instincts are, are just clearly there with him. And the mobility is really hard to find in a guy that size who's that long as well. Um, I, I, we, we haven't played this game in a little while because the back part of the season didn't really give us much reason to. But I have to ask you, Big V, in the Miami Heat game, uh, there was a, se- a, a sequence late in the game where Sham Shea picked up a rebound, took it the distance himself. Got a little bounce pass to a cutter from the 45, led to a kick out to the corner for three. Uh, what sound did you make when Ulrich Shamshay grabbed, went, and threw that beautiful little bounce pass? Probably I should go with something like, ooh. That's good. Yeah. I was going to go, <laughs> you know, maybe less muted than that. I was like, a, ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of the sound I went with. But yeah, uh, you know, let us know your sounds. Spell them out uh, however you want to spell them in the phonetically, I guess, in the uh, chat. Uh, do some automatopias, please, in the, in the comments. Let us know what sound you made when Al Shamshe had that one really cool sequence where he grabbed the ball, ran, and dropped a cool-ass bounce pass on the run. Uh, we're going to come back on the other side here, Big V. Round it out with the uh, talk about Gary Trent Jr. and Christian Coloco. A little bit of news and notes from the last week since I've been out on vacation. Vacation. Talk about Trent going to the Bucks. We'll talk about Coloco getting closer, it seems, to being cleared by the NBA to return to action. Does that mean anything for the Raptors? We'll get to that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home huge wins keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers Wrapping things up here with Vivek Jacob as we get into a couple of news and notes items. Before we do that, just a reminder, Locked On Sports Today 24-7 is your all-day streaming channel with Locked On shows running all the live long day, covering the biggest stories in sports. You can go check it out, put it on, have it run in the background all day long, uh, you know, at least until the Olympics are on, and that becomes your background noise. Locked On Sports Today 24-7 might be your background noise as you do whatever tasks it is you are doing throughout your work day. All right. Let's get back to it here. A couple of news and notes items as I was out for the last week or so on vacation. We should probably hit on Gary Trent Jr. Officially not coming back to the Toronto Raptors. The GTJ era is over. He is going to the Milwaukee Bucks on a minimum deal. Basically standing in for Malik Beasley in that Bucks starting five uh, now going forward. Reunited with Damian Lillard, which is a fun little thing. Thoughts on the Gary Trent Jr. to Milwaukee move and uh, any sort of lingering thoughts on Trent, the Raptors, whether they should have kept him around, et cetera, et cetera. I think in a perfect scenario, Gary would have found uh, a deal with the Raptors front office where Mm. he could have been a stopgap option for another year and maybe just eased uh, the transition of a Grady Dick and a Jacoby Walter and um, and kind of get that betting in process. But Mm -hmm. uh, 
Now you kind of just throw them into the fire, right? That shooting guard position looks exclusively a development position. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I think when you look at Gary, uh, it was kind of kicking the can down the road in terms of Norman Powell and saying, hey, okay, are we getting someone with a similar skill set? Uh, I think uh, when you look back on it, you, I, I think you just keep Norman Powell. I, I think yeah, I when, disagree there. But I, carry I, on. I think when you look at the money that normal Norman Powell <laughs> cost over the years, uh, it, it was pretty much the same as Gary. When you look at the leadership that Norman Powell brought to the table, um, the way he was just comfortable in that bench unit, uh, being the sixth man, all, I think all of those factors, uh, I, I would have been quite happy to just have Powell, uh, you know, uh help usher in that new era uh and be alongside fred and pascal uh and og and uh yeah I, I think those are my overall thoughts on it like the fact that gary was never able to materialize into something better than just uh, you know a free agent uh departing without uh any return uh, i think in hindsight I, I definitely would have rather just had norman powell yeah, I think I disagree there a little bit just because I think the again, the process and the thinking behind the trade was, I think, pretty sound. It was, hey, let's get a guy who's six years younger, who has a pretty similar skill set, you know, not so good on defense, some offensive pop and, and three point shooting. And let's just see here if we can kind of get a younger version of a similar player. And as much as Norm has had some success since leaving the Raptors, I don't think he's been like unbelievable he still is one of the worst on ball defenders in basketball would not have helped the Raptors in that regard and I think you could argue Trent even though he's not a good defender himself because of the event creation stuff for him defensively is actually probably a net better defender than Norman Powell is obviously Powell has way more um, sort of creativity to his offensive game he can sort of pop off at any time for you know those pull up threes and flying around screens and getting to the rim like his offensive package way more appealing than Trent's but I think the move made a ton of sense at the time. And I don't know if we should go back and sort of retcon it because it didn't work out three, four years later. I think all you can do with trades like that is just hope that the upside hits. It didn't for Gary, and that's unfortunate. But he also did provide a lot to the Raptors, I think, just as one of the only three-point shooters on the team for, for, for many years. Like, I think he helped with the development of Scotty Barnes in a way, right? Him and Barnes always had really good on-court chemistry. I think him and Siakam always had really good on-court chemistry and good on-off numbers. I think Trent was one of the guys who helped make the Siakam-Barnes duo work the way it did for the times that it worked well. Trent was a key cog in all of that. That 21-22 season where they go to the playoffs, win 48 games, uh, I think Trent was incredibly important to that team, one of the most important guys on the roster. And so, um, yeah, it, it sucks that he leaves for nothing now, but I, I think... Honestly, I think it was well worth the three and a half year look at a guy who was six years younger than Norman Powell to see if he could be something a little more than Norm. And I, I think Norm is not the level of player that you're sitting there regretting not having him on the team for the last few seasons. They probably would have waited too long to trade Norm and gotten nothing back for him anyway, uh, <laughs> as the Raptors have done over the last few seasons. But um, fine to disagree on that one for sure. Christian Coloco, let's get to him quickly here. Um, some reporting over the weekend that he's getting closer to potentially being clear by the NBA to play. He's had some surgery to rectify the blood clot issue he was dealing with. Um, and, and of course, he'll be an unrestricted free agent if he is clear by the NBA to return to action. There's been talk of the Raptors maybe kind of getting back in and bringing him in. That said, the Raptors, of course, have a full roster at the moment. The Sasha Vizenkov thing hangs over there. Javon Freeman Liberty, one of the best players in summer league, is non guaranteed right now. Maybe he gets that spot if Vizenkov's not around um, and is more of a surefire thing. Uh, what do you think about Coloco? Uh, I'm of the mind that it would be nice. I'm rooting for him to get back in the NBA, but I'm not sure the Raptors should be like hitching their hopes to a guy who hasn't played in a year to be their backup center. That said, he's a little bit older. He had some development within the system. He knows what's going on. He's been around. Um, maybe there's something there. Thoughts on Coloco as a potential backup center option for the Raptors if he is in fact cleared and the Raptors are able to find that roster space for him. 
Yeah, first off, if he can get back to playing uh, NBA basketball, that's just amazing. Uh, Incredible, it'll be, yeah. It, it'll be amazing to just see him back on a court again uh, for whichever team. Um, I, I would be open to the idea of bringing Coloco back. I think uh, especially, you know, having Yak and Kelly, it, there isn't maybe that pressure to be like the first big off the bench. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? And, and mm -hmm. so I think that would ease things for him and make for an easier return uh, to the league. And, you know, and then th there was still enough kind of intrigue uh, with with his rookie season and what he brought to the table. Again, we talk about uh, defensive in instincts with uh, Shomche. Like mm -hmm. if Coloco can get back to some of that intrigue that he showed um, and again, you know, improve that finishing around the basket and all of that, uh, then I think there's still a player there uh, mm -hmm. and an intriguing one. So I, I would be open to bringing him back. Obviously, as you mentioned, the Vizenkov thing needs to be sorted. Uh, whether that goes to uh, JFL will, remains to be seen. Um, but I would be happy to see if there's a way to keep him in the mix for sure. Yeah, like it, it's a very low downside thing like that roster spot's probably not going to be used by a better player at this point and so why not get a guy that you know in I, I just think it's probably worth tempering expectations i don't think he's going to walk in and become like a no-brainer 20 minute a night backup or anything like right. that as great as that would be um but yeah uh, you know we'll see well i'm sure we'll get some clarity on that in the next couple weeks here month whatever it is and we'll talk about it when we have a little bit more in terms of hard news on that but man poor javon freeman liberty if uh <laughs> <laughs> if the Vizenkov thing doesn't work out and the spot's there and it goes to Coloco and not him after a, a good summer league and really good G League season, I mean, JFL is a, he feels like the kind of guy who maybe is just best as a G League best player on a team as opposed to like a role player in the NBA. Um, we'll see how it all goes. But yeah, interesting stuff. Maybe some back end of roster changes between now and the start of the season that we'll get to talk about. But if not, um, hey. Uh, we'll just find ways to fill air otherwise uh, in different ways uh, <laughs> with that we're going to leave it there Big V any, anything you want to promote for the good people out there uh, usual stuff I, I should have my next uh, Raptors in 7 post coming soon uh, and it's, it's more of just like a summer league review and my thoughts so you mm -hmm. can look forward to that uh, and besides that yeah regular stuff going on at Sportsnet there's a T20 cricket tournament coming to Canada soon. Uh, so I'll be doing some coverage on that. So you can look forward Sweet. to that. You can follow it all on Twitter at Vivek M. Jacob. Everyone go do that. Uh, of course, you can find me at Woodley Sean. Follow, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff on the podcast app of your choosing on YouTube as well. Tomorrow on the show, I think Oren Weisfeld is going to hop in. We're going to talk about the men's and women's national teams ahead of the Olympics and tee up the tournaments on both sides. Super exciting stuff. Obviously, we'll have plenty of Olympic coverage once the tournament kicks up on Friday. Uh, I frankly cannot wait. It's going to be freaking awesome. And so, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get deep into that. Katie Hind will probably stop by this week for a debrief from Summer League. She was in the desert for like, uh, it seemed like a month. And we're going to talk about the desert with... Katie Heindel, uh, Jamar Hines back on this week as well. We got a loaded week of shows for you. And we're still working on scheduling it, but very soon we will be doing the over unders and props review episode to determine who won between myself, Vivek, and Sahal for the 2023 24 season. And of course, who won among you, the sickos who submitted your own entries in our over unders competition. Uh, the winner will receive a pair of tickets to a game next season, which is very exciting times. Um, but yeah, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again on Tuesday with a Team Canada centric episode of Locked On Raptors. Thanks for hanging. Bye bye. Oh! oh.